Welcome back everyone. Today we're going to turn our attention to the role that law enforcement plays in investigating and processing sex crimes. This lecture focuses on what happens once a crime is reported. From the initial statements that are taken, evidence collection, interviewing victims and suspects, and finally processing that evidence for prosecution purposes. Let's go ahead and get started with this topic. Once a crime is reported or detected, patrol officers are typically the first to respond to a sex offense. They will make initial contact with the victim, make an arrest if the offender is still on scene, and will process the crime scene. That officer is responsible for assessing what has happened, for, basic, for collecting basic information as well. This requires the officer to make contact with the victim and to determine if evidence needs to be collected. The officer will get a very detailed statement from the victim. Who was the offender? What did he or she look like? What are their basic characteristics if the offender was a stranger? What were the circumstances surrounding the assault? All of this information should be written down for investigators to use later. But all of this falls within the primary task of interviewing the victim. Once the patrol officer fulfills his or her task, they pass the case off to a detective who will begin a thorough investigation of the crime. The detective will typically conduct a secondary interview with the victim to see if there are any changes from the initial interview or to see if the victim remembers any new information after the initial shock of the assault has worn off. Once the detective has enough information to identify a suspect and possibly to make an arrest, then they will hand the case over to a prosecutor who will charge the individual with a specific crime. As I mentioned before, as part of investigating the crime, a detective will need to interview the victim to figure out exactly what happened in the case. But this interview is very different than the type of interview that would occur with a suspect. This is in no way an interrogation and the victim needs to be treated with a level of sensitivity. The victim is not at fault and is not criminally liable for anything, so they should not be treated the same way. Remember that after a sexual assault, the victim is experiencing a multitude of feelings, including shame, disgust, anger, fear, and that they have had their trust violated, possibly by someone that they used to trust implicitly. If the detective comes into the interview accusing the victim or judging the victim, then they are going to make the situation worse and the victim will probably shut down. We do not want to victimize the individual a second time then they may feel as though there is no help available and may be unwilling to cooperate with the investigation out of self-preservation. When interviewing victims, officers want to give the victim information about the interview process and request his or her feedback. They should also give the victim as much control as possible, asking how she would like to describe the event while responding to her request, particularly in attempts to make her feel more comfortable. The officer should be reassuring to the victim if she expresses feelings of guilt, fear, or humiliation. These are commonly expressed emotions, and the officer needs to be remind, needs to remind the victim rather that they are not at fault or in trouble in any way. The interview should not be too grueling or too long. The, the interview should allow for breaks or low stress questions after asking questions that may be humiliating or have to do with a sexual assault. But the officer should always start off using professional terminology for body parts and for sex acts, and then explain if they are not understood by the victim. This is not something to be taken lightly, so using slang terminology is considered unprofessional and degrading to the victim. This is important because the officer does not want to be perceived as being voyeuristic. Anytime the officer ask a, asks a question, it should be worded in a way that is not judgmental or threatening to the victim. They should help the victim understand that sexuality is not the main issue in the crime. Rather, force and exercising power and control are important elements of the crime. It is important to make the victim feel comfortable because the detective needs to ask questions that are going to be uncomfortable to answer, but that are necessary in order to get enough information to find the suspect and make a case for the prosecutor. For instance, the officer will need to ask about the way that the offender approached the victim and gained control and then maintained control. Were you grabbed from behind, for instance? Was your drink spiked? How did this all begin? Did the offender use any sort of physical force in order to subdue you? This could involve a weapon or threat of violence. If the offender used force, how did you respond? 
Did you scream? Did you struggle? Were you able to fight back in any way? Resistance is not required, but the detective needs to ask about it regardless. If you did try to resist, how did the offender react to that resistance? Did they hit you? Did they run away? Did they injure you with the weapon or make greater threats against you? Any variety of reaction could occur here. The officer will also ask whether the offender experienced any sort of sexual dysfunction. Some offenders desire to engage in sexual assault, but are physically unable to become aroused once the event is happening. This may require them to use foreign objects as a mean of, means of penetration, if that is their end goal. The detective will also need details regarding all types of sex acts in which the victim was forced to engage in and the order in which they occurred. This often says a lot about the offender. Some offenders are opportunists and only want to engage in the rape. Others are more systematic and desire to do things in a certain order as a way of meeting their own expectations. When things don't go in the proper sequence, or if the victim does not comply with that order, then the offender may not be satisfied with the assault and could possibly abandon it altogether or lash out against the victim. The offender, the, or the officer rather, will need to know about anything the offender has said and his tone. Was he angry? Did he say certain things or make the victim say certain things? Was there a script of some kind or a scenario that the offender was trying to implement? What about the offender's demeanor or attitude? Did it change at any point during the assault? And what happened immediately before it changed? The detective is trying to find a possible catalyst that set the offender off or interrupted his plans during the assault. During the assault, did the offender take any actions to prevent the victim from identifying the offender? Did the offender wear a mask? Did the offender blindfold the victim? Was the room dark? Was the victim turned away from the offender? If the offense took place in the victim's home, did the offender take any of the victim's personal belongings? Commonly, offenders may take a memento from the scene to remember the offense. This could be a piece of clothing that the victim was wearing, for instance. The detective will also want to know if the victim has any information to lead her to believe that she was specifically targeted, such as contact with strangers before or after the assault. This reaches into the point as to whether this was someone that the victim knew, had a previous relationship with, or if we are dealing with a total stranger. A familiar offender will be easier to track down and locate, but if it was a stranger, then the officer will need as much information as possible about the offender in order to find this individual. This will include a description focused on how people familiar with the offender on a daily basis would describe him. What are his specific characteristics like? Information is needed about height, weight, race, hair color, eye color, and any other details that the victim may remember. The problem here is that while we are going through something traumatic like a sexual assault, our brains often do not retain these details as clearly as we would like for prosecution purposes. It's incredibly important to make sure that the officer does his or her best to make sure that the victim is not traumatized or victimized a second time. It's very difficult to have, to have to continuously discuss a very scary and harmful experience like a sexual assault. The longer the victim discusses things with law enforcement, the more likely it is that they may develop PTSD. Research suggests that those who report their assaults to the police are more likely to develop the disorder than those who do not report their assault. This is likely due to recounting the crime over and over again. Reliving those details is difficult for the mind to endure. Police can make things worse if they take an accusatory stance towards the victim or do not do everything they can to reassure the victim that reporting is the right thing to do or that they're help, helping to find the offender by providing these answers. It is a thin line for law enforcement to balance. As part of their job, they need to get as many details as possible from the victim and any other witnesses. And when there is information missing, they do their best to fill those gaps. But victims could interpret this as being harassing or that the investigator does not believe their story. This is particularly true in cases where the victim is perceived to have questionable moral character, 
or if the victim has engaged in risky behavior before the assault occurred. For instance, any time a prostitute is raped, the police are less likely to believe the victim due to the nature of her work. She was engaging in something illegal and was selling sex for money. It is hard to believe that she was really raped when these other things were occurring first. As police officers' beliefs about sex offenses may impact their behavior towards victims, their beliefs, as well as victims' experiences with officers, are also of interest to researchers. Like anyone else, police officers are not without bias. They're people too, and their work experiences often impact the way that they handle cases. Research suggests that police officers are likely to be skeptical of cases that do not adhere to the stereotypical rape formula, indicating a belief in rape -ness. If the offender was not a stranger, if force was not involved, or if the victim was not seriously harmed, then many officers believe that the rape was not as severe or as significant as other types of sexual assault. If the officer lets these biases get in the way of how he or she handles a case, then it can have an impact on the victim's experience. If she is being blamed and having her personal life examined and used to discredit her, then she may experience what is called a second rape. If the victim reports the crime to law enforcement early enough after the assault happened, the police will often complete a rape kit in which they collect physical evidence from the victim. One of the biggest hurdles to the collection of a rape kit is that the victim will often do things that impede the collection of viable evidence. For instance, after the assault, the victim may have a strong desire to shower, but from a prosecutorial standpoint, that's the worst thing to do because it washes off any potential DNA that the offender may have left behind. Rape, kids, rape kits rather, are a standardized practice and are done at hospitals. There is a specific order that the kit must be done in, so most commonly a doctor and a specialized nurse who is trained in sexual assault evidence collection will complete the kit. Same nurses work at nearly every hospital and are an essential part of the evidence collection process. These individuals are also trained in working with the victims in terms of anticipating their needs and their emotional responses. Although every rape kit is standardized in terms of what is included in the kit, every sexual assault is different. The kit anticipates all sorts of scenarios, but the available evidence may differ. There might be DNA available, so the victim will be swabbed and photographed pretty much everywhere else, or everywhere, rather, just in case. All clothing will be collected, all injuries will be documented and treated, and the victim's personal history will be documented as well. This is important for medical purposes. The doctor needs to know if there is a history of sexual assault, if the victim has been sexually active recently, if the victim has a significant other, and other information that will help with the evidence collection process. As I just mentioned, the doctor will need to know if the victim has been sexually active recently. This is not for shaming purposes, but if the victim has engaged in consensual sexual activity, then the doctor needs to know that information in order to be able to differentiate what can be attributed to the rape and what can be attributed to the consensual sex. We know that DNA is the most important and often the most helpful piece of evidence in a sexual assault investigation. If the offender is male, then specifically we are looking for semen. But if the victim was sexually active recently, we need to figure out if the DNA belongs to her partner or to the offender. Of course, there can be DNA left behind that is not semen, but it is a common piece of evidence to be collected. So, in order to differentiate the law, states that law enforcement can collect DNA from any consensual partners in order to compare samples. This is often to eliminate the significant other from the suspect list, but remember that over 90% of sexual assaults occur when the victim knows the offender, so it's possible that a match will occur as well. DNA could be anywhere. Not only is the victim examined, but the victim's belongings and clothing are examined as well. Anything that was on or near the victim's person during the assault will be examined for any sort of DNA. Semen, hair, skin cells, urine, anything at all. But remember that if the victim does anything to clean up after the assault, such as taking a shower or cleaning their clothing, then the DNA can be lost and the investigation compromised.
When a rape kit is conducted immediately after the assault, the same nurse will have the victim remove his or her clothing piece by piece. This will be done over a white sheet so that, any sort, so that if any debris or evidence sample falls off of the clothing, it will fall onto the sheet. Each piece of clothing will be cataloged and photographed. The nurse will look for evidence stains or tears in the clothing. This will be helpful to investigators later on. Once the victim has removed all clothing, then the victim's body will be examined next. This examination will include documentation of any obvious injuries, no matter how small they are. Any dried blood or other secretions will be swabbed. A black light will also be used to pick up any evidence that is not visible to the naked eye. This will provide the doctor and the nurse the opportunity to examine every part of the body's every part of the victim's body for evidence. The victim's mouth, ears, and nose will all be swabbed as well to make sure that nothing is overlooked. Next, the victim's fingernails will be swabbed and scraped. The fingers are of particular interest because often DNA gets under the nails, especially if the victim tries to fight back. Here the examiners are looking for skin cells or semen that might not have been washed away. If the victim touches the offender at all, then it is likely the examiners will find something there. Now it's time for the more intimate part of the examination. As the assault commonly involves penetration, the victim's genitalia will be examined for injury and for evidence. The victim's pubic hair will be examined, swabbed, and combed for evidence. If the offender ejaculates, it is likely that DNA will be left behind in the victim's pubic hair. The forensic examiners are also looking for the offender's hair. They will take samples to compare the victim's hair to any other hair follicles that are found on the victim's person. Anything that differs could be identified as the offender, but it could be the victim's significant other as well, which is another important reason for why that individual must provide a DNA sample to law enforcement as it is important to rule out any possible suspects. The victim's genitalia will be examined for injury and evidence. This involves an examination of the victim's mouth, vagina, if it is a woman, and anus. Any sort of visible injury will be photographed, measured for size, and treated once any additional evidence is collected. This is an important step for law enforcement, but often one of the most difficult for the victim to go through. It is a very intimate and invasive process. The examination team is looking for evidence that is inside your person, and that requires more invasive techniques like the use of a colposcope and through the application of blue dye that highlights injuries and broken skin. In order to examine that nothing else happened to the victim, multiple people may be in the examination room, including a doctor, a nurse, and perhaps a, perhaps a rape crisis counselor as well. Sometimes a family member or loved one can be in the room, but it is not always allowed. Even though rape kits are routinely collected from victims and are meant to aid prosecutors in the, in the prosecution of offenders, these kits often sit on shelves for long periods of time left untested. There are simply too many kits and not enough forensic examiners who are capable of testing these kits. Some cities do not have the technology and must send their kits to larger labs to be examined. So that lab has to do the testing for two places instead of one and do not receive budget increases most times. These kits are all sitting on shelves somewhere collecting dust and we know that DNA evidence is often very helpful in securing convictions. In some cases, prosecutors must move their case forward before the kit can be tested. If a defendant takes a plea deal, then the rape kit becomes a moot point anyway. But if the defendant decides to go to full trial, then this DNA might be the necessary item needed to secure a conviction and the prosecutor does not have access to it. In the early 2000s, we became more aware of the backlog of untested rape kits. As you can see from this map of the United States, there are some pretty large cities with large amounts of untested rape kits. In particular, Detroit, Memphis, and Dallas all stand out with thousands of kits sitting somewhere left untested. Your book describes the efforts of one prosecutor in Detroit who pushed for kits to be tested. Of the 3,231 kits that she had tested, 567 came back with DNA matches and 87 of those were matched to serial rapists. 
Testing all rape kits for DNA can help solve rapes and identify serial rapists as shown by the example that comes out of Detroit. However, there are some legitimate arguments against testing and reasons for not reasons to not test particular rape kits. As I stated earlier, a defendant who takes a plea deal negates the need for DNA testing. But if law enforcement doesn't have any idea who the suspect might be, the DNA evidence in a rape kit can identify a person who left semen or other biological evidence on the body of the victim. One downside to this is if the DNA is tested and it belongs to a significant other or consensual partner and that person is not the offender, then the rape kit was tested unnecessarily. Then the evidence in the kit obtained cannot prove a sexual offense occurred through DNA means alone. In this lecture, we focused on the role that law enforcement plays in the collection of evidence and the techniques needed to interview victims compared to suspects. It is important that law enforcement treat the victim with respect, compassion, and sympathy, or the victim runs the risk of feeling re-victimized and might not be willing to cooperate with law enforcement anymore out of a sense of self-preservation. If the rape is reported early enough after it is completed, then a rape kit may be conducted in order to gather evidence which would aid in the discovery and prosecution of the offender. However, this is a very sensitive process and requires trained medical staff who are adept at completing these examinations. Not everyone can do this. Victims are in a very vulnerable position during a rape kit examination and must endure a very invasive and time-consuming process only for the rape kit to remain untested, sitting on a shelf for years. It is not an easy thing for the victim to go through by any means, but it must be done if at all possible. Next time we will make our way um, into the prosecutor's office, excuse me, and discuss what it means to build a case against a sex offender. Meet me back here next time as we focus on chapter eight, prosecuting sex offenders in the courts. Thanks everyone for your time and I hope you have a great day.